that's just wrapping up the questions. So I'm sure she'll join us soon. Jay, thanks. Okay. Uh, who, who, who is sending that message? Who's speaking? Baba Keng from uh, the AG office. Baba Keng. IT. IT. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh-uh. Uh, uh, yeah, look. Yeah. yeah, sorry, he Jay. Uh, like that way. Yeah, yeah, sorry, apologies, <laughs> Jay. Now, Oba King is just he, he's at, uh, assisting AG and them, making sure they'll connect. Uh, but it's idle coming in here, Chair. I'm in the DAG's office, and I have received a message from them that they're just busy wrapping up their meeting with the cabinet. So they will join us, Chair. Thanks. Okay, Jay, let's just give them a few minutes. Uh, a few minutes. Uh, Sianda. On that opportunity, maybe I must come in as well. Sianda. For accountability. Who, who is, I can't see Sianda. It's Fezeka. It's Fezeka, but it's okay to say. Where is Sianda? Sianda was speaking to Peter Paul on the other side. Um, and he's supposed to be on the platform. So, <laughs> we are sitting yeah. in different I'm locations. Here, I'm here, I'm here. I'm here oh, you're there. And then first Yes, like, huh? yes I just spoke to you. Person. That's right. Yes, as I uh, want to say, Jay, that what we requested was to have AG set up way she has gone for the cabinet. AGE is here. Fazeka, AGE is here. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thanks, uh, Fazeka. Uh, we, don't need, we don't need many voices. Eh? There must be one accounting voice, single accounting voice from the office of the AG. AG. Uh, good good AG. morning, Honorable Chair. Good morning. Good morning, Honorable Chair. Yeah, members. yeah. It's a very hectic morning, unfortunately. Uh, we hope we hope you make it. You're from the grilling from the cabinet, yeah? <laughs> yes, uh, and that's I, I hope your meeting. Yeah, I hope your meeting went well. Uh, welcome, AG and the team. Um, you are here to table to us um, a third account um, on the uh, current uh, civil administration, uh, which uh, embodies uh, a number of elements, uh, which is inclusive of the public entities, uh, which are a responsibility of the Office of the Auditor General. And um, we seek to welcome you, and uh, we suppose to be the two standing committees, a standing committee on public accounts and the standing committee uh, on AXA. So we wish to welcome uh, uh, both uh, the members of those uh, committees. Can I check? Is uh, Scopa in? Uh, good morning, um, Babu Swamilu, and to good all the morning, colleagues, uh, AG and your team. Um, good, good morning, morning. Uh, Mr. Frangwa. Uh, uh, and no. uh, we hope that your team is uh, following you. You are more than welcome. Yeah, if you are here, then we are here. <laughs> no, fine. No, no, Chair, then, we are, uh, can we? We are thank here. you very much. We are here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, honorable members. Can we therefore welcome the Auditor General who is going to give us a briefing uh, on the uh, PFMA uh, findings uh, for the year? Uh, 2020 2021. Welcome, AG, and your team. AG? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. And I'd like to also greet the Honorable Chairman of SCOPA, um, the Honorable members that are present from both committees. Um, I see my colleagues from the Audit Office are here present. I'd like to welcome them too. And greetings to all that are on the platform, including some of the members of the media that I see. Honorable Chair, I value the opportunity to represent the audit of the auditor, or the office of the Auditor General in this way, and to share the work that we've done in conducting the audits 
for the year ended March 2021. As you know, the, the year that started on the 1st of April 2020 and ended on the 31st of March 2021 was a difficult one for, for South Africa, but also for everybody across the globe. So that we've been able to complete these audits and, and report on them in this way and support accountability and oversight in the way that we're doing now is credit to the teams that lead the auditees in terms of the departments and the public entities and government, as well as the teams and the office of the Auditor General. Um, so I'd like to, um, to acknowledge the, the great effort that they've made in getting us to this point. Uh, for without them, we, we wouldn't be able to execute our mandate. Honorable Chair, I think it's always good to, to start off where we ended off when we shared with you the, the 2020 outcomes. That was back in March of this year. And at that time, we, we, we tabled a report that we themed a continued call to act on accountability. And our key messages here was that, one, we, we were seeing an improvement in audit outcomes, and we were acknowledging that. However, we cautioned that we were not yet seeing evidence of the progressive changes that were needed to ensure sustainable improvements in the integrity, transparency, and accountability of public institutions. In specific terms, in 2020, we called for stronger preventative controls. We called for greater attention to be paid to state-owned entities, public entities, as well as the key service delivery departments. And at that time, we highlighted health and education. Um, we talked about the importance of instilling good financial management disciplines across all of the departments and entities, because that was where we could make sure that funds were being protected and that indeed there was transparency and accountability. Uh, we, we, we highlighted that it was important to prevent leakages in the first instance, but also be swift about meeting out consequences and consistent about that, and also uh, recovering funds that were being lost. Whilst we noted the, the continued support for the implementation of the MI process, uh, given the new powers that were given to the Auditor General, we talked about how it was important for everybody that had responsibilities over public funds to play their part. Um, because we felt that the MI process was a good one, which was going to complement the efforts of other actors in the accountability ecosystem. So that was the message we shared with you at the end of the 2020 audit, audit results. This time around, um, I'd like to start off with the good news. So we're seeing a continuing trend of improvements. Um, and maybe the slide is a little busy. I'm going to explain it. The top half spells out the outcomes as we had them up until the 15th of October 2021. Remember, this is a year that ended on the 31st of March 2021, and the submissions of those audit, 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 those financial statements was due to be made as of the 31st of May. We then continued with our work in the background, and we are now able to revise our, our initial assessment and get to outcomes which are now on the bottom half of the slide. The reason you've got these two outcomes, and, and I want to just sit on this for a moment, the blue part of these, these circles, so the extreme right-hand uh, part of the slide, sets out the audits that were outstanding at each of these two dates. On the 15th of October, we still had 42 audits outstanding, um, outstanding in that they were not yet completed, um, making up 10% of the 425 audits that we were reporting on. We then continued the work. We've signed off a few more in the interim, and now we have 34 audits that are not yet completed. And that's important to point out because there's a story around there and a message for oversight that you need to attend to in terms of these audits that are not yet completed. I will come to that in a moment. Back to the good news. 115 clean audits that we can register in this year across the provincial and national government departments and public entities. That's a good outcome because they represent 27% of the auditees that we're reporting on, but they also represent 19% of the expenditure budget. So what it tells you is that of the 1.9 trillion rand that has been appropriated for the PFMA cycle, you've got that money, 19% of that money held by departments and public entities that can report credibly on how they've managed those finances, that they can report in a way that's useful and reliable, credible, on how they've performed, 
and they can demonstrate that they have adequate controls to avoid non-compliance with key laws and regulations relating to performance and financial management. So these are well-run institutions. We don't say that they are performing in terms of their mandate. We don't say that they are performing in terms of the APPs that the, the uh, members of, of parliament and the legislatures would have approved, but at least it's a good start for a conversation about accountability. So that's a good outcome because this demonstrates resilience. It demonstrates the opportunity to drive increased uh, performance. I come to the yellow zone. The, the yellow zone represents audits that have received an audit outcome that is unqualified on the financial statements, so an unqualified audit opinion on the financial statements, meaning that the financial statements are credible. It's got Audities in the same category where whilst the financial statements are credible, the performance information or the compliance information is problematic in one way or the other. Many of these audits, at least we can celebrate, have got credible financial statements that they can report on. If you add the two categories, you get to over 70% of the PFMA auditees with credible financial statements. Now that's a very strong platform on which to build in terms of deepening improvements and accelerating improvements in accountability. And I, and I think I want us to just bank that. Good outcome in that high number of clean audits and a good outcome in terms of high number of audits and audits that can at least record what they've done with the monies appropriated to them. The ones that are in the qualified zone, um, those are the ones where our concern is that they are unable to report faithfully on what they've done with the monies appropriated to them, and they are having problems planning their performance, reporting on their performance, monitoring it even, um, and they've got compliance issues. So that's 17% that's of qualified audit opinions is, is, is another area that needs attention. When we look at a combination of the yellow and the purple zone, we see that a number of these audits have actually stayed in those categories for a great deal of time. And so it tells us that there is some complacency in terms of moving them out of that zone. Yes, I've said that it's good to have credible financial information, but it's not enough. We've got to get all of these auditees dealing with performance information and dealing with compliance. The last point on the slide is that the, the pink and the red represent adverse and disclaimer audit opinions, respectively. None of the departments are sitting in these categories. These categories see only the public entities. So there's a story that we need to just take account of in terms of these public entities. I'll talk about it just now. But having made the point, good, good performance, we're moving in the right direction, very encouraging but there's a lot more work still to be done. The next slide, honorable chairpersons and honorable members, sets out the journey around what we've done with, with dealing with these delays. Um, and, and the story really is about, it sets out in the next slide, I think we can move to the next slide, which really sets out the big story about what is happening with these 34 orders that were outstanding as at the 1st of December. Many of them are public entities that have not been submitting financial statements for audit. So you've got the SAA group, which has been under uh, business rescue. Um, you've got the SA Express, which has been under provisional liquidation. You've got Danal and its group companies. Um, you've got the government of printing works, government printing works, which is which is an entity that suffered data loss over the course of the financial year and has requested time to, to sort that out. You've got a number of entities in the Northwest, um, the Northwest Transport Investments, Atridgeville Bus Services, and Northwest Star, which haven't been submitting financials for a great deal of time. And in fact, now uh, we have information that they are now under liquidation as well. The, the, the um, Coastal TVET College has been under administration since December of 2020. It was previously a disclaimer auditee. And I missed one, which is the Compensation Commissioner for Occupational Disease in Mines and Works, so that's CCOD. That has, that's an entity that has a long history of not submitting financials. In fact, the 2020 financial year audit has now begun with their, with their submission recently. The, the, and then there are 
Financial statements that were submitted late. So the audits are underway, not yet completed. In there, you've got IDT, you've got PetroSA, and you've got UIF as well as PRASA. You'll remember that most of those audits have disclaimer audit opinions from the prior years. So they do need some attention in terms of oversight and in terms of, of management and consequence management. The right-hand part of that slide sets out where we've got delays uh, around the audit process. So we had technical disputes around the Western Cape Department of Community Safety and Provincial Treasury, and we've been in dialogue with the National Treasury around clarifying the interpretations of the, uh, the Treasury regulations that apply to those, to those departments. There are matters at SAPO, Land Bank, TCTA, Water Trading Entity, Road Accident Fund, the Ingonyama Trust, National Lotteries Commission, National Lottery Distribution Trust Fund, where we have not been able to complete those audits, even though financials were submitted, because of either audit queries or technical issues that are raised, we've not been able to complete those audits. Uh, there are also other delays in the audit processes at Post Bank, Autopex, and um, Marine Safety Authority. I said these out so that you can get a sense of what sits behind those 34 audits that are outstanding um, and, and to really drive a message that all of these auditees need special attention from oversight. The number of public entities that are sitting with disclaimer audit opinions, we have completed 13 of these auditees with disclaimer audit opinions. Most of these public entities have repeat disclaimer audit opinions in that year after year, they get disclaimer audit opinion. At the national level, you've got the National Skills Fund and the Compensation Fund with disclaimer audit opinions. At the provincial level, you've got the Free State Development Corporation, the Northwest Development Corporation, Housing, housing Fund, and then entities in the Northwest province, uh, the Golden Leopard Resorts Group. Um, then you've got a few TVET colleges that have got repeat disclaimers. It was important for us to, to shine a spotlight on these outstanding orders because I think they can help to uh, channel the effort from an oversight point of view. If we come now to the, to the story about clean audit outcomes, and just to make the point again, this administration has been driving increases, increases in the number of clean audits over time. My team tells me that there are a number of audits that we could have even moved into the clean audit zone had they not had one or two problems. So they say that there are 31 audits where with a little bit of effort, we could get them to the clean audit zone. Many of the orders that have that are sitting with with uh, clean audits are the smaller departments, uh, the provincial treasuries, the provincial cocktails, the DPME. What we've now got to do is say to them, "Well, you've got good controls in your own environment as an institution. You are showing us what it is that you're delivering as oversight. We are now going to pay particular attention to your APP before we approve it." Your annual performance plan must now mirror much closely the, the uh, mandate that you have. So that if you're the provincial treasury, let's say for um, KZN, we've got to make sure that you're fulfilling your role in driving improved accountability throughout provincial government, improved expenditure management throughout provincial government departments and entities, and we've got to make sure that you're playing your role in supporting the municipalities. If you're a provincial cocktail like you have in the Eastern Cape that's now got a clean audit, how do we build on the, the success you have as an institution to make sure that you can now fulfill your mandate as given in law? If we look at the MFMA, how are you fulfilling those responsibilities that are actually given to you? And how does that manifest in improvements around how the municipalities in your province operate? So it's a good base to drive different conversations around accountability. You can now have a conversation about service delivery because at least the basics are in place. The, the key service delivery departments, much as we said last year, these departments remain as lagging the, the, the improvement drive. So if you look at the key service delivery departments of health, education, public works and human settlements across the country. We've only got two of those that had clean audit outcomes and those related to the Western Cape's prov uh, provincial department of health and department of public works. All other departments were either sitting in unqualified space 
at, so that they had credible financials, but they were struggling with performance information or, and or compliance. A number of them were sitting in the qualified space. The good thing is that we no longer have these big departments sitting with disclaimer or adverse audit opinions as we had many years ago. So that's important to note. So we must not go back there. What we must do is push against the complacency that has set in. And we say complacency because many of these big departments have been sitting in these two categories for a great deal of time. The majority of them have not moved one way or the other for a number of years. So what it tells us is that there tends to be far too much of a celebration of, of, of unqualified audit opinions and not enough attention to the other aspects that drive accountability and transparency, such as performance information and compliance. If you've got a Department of Health that's not able to demonstrate that they, are, they, they, they can give you credible performance information, what that tells us is that the ability to plan for performance, to monitor it and supervise that there is proper performance, that ability is not there. That's why the reports are problematic. What that does is that it makes it difficult for the province and even for the nation to say with confidence that we are making the gains that we ought to in terms of service delivery. If you've got, let's say, the HIV and AIDS treatment program and you're unable to confirm that it is being rolled out in the way that parliament has been told it will be and parliament expects, and in the way that the recipients of that service need to see, then you're not going to be able to course correct, let alone make sure that over time you achieve your goals and aspirations. If you've also got a department of health in a province whose health facilities are unable to set up the systems, controls, and disciplines around how they are performing and how they don't have records management to, to show what they've done in treating each and every patient, how they have allocated resources to make sure that their service delivery is happening in the way that's expected. When it comes time to reporting, it's a problem, but also the other problem that arises is that when there is an incident that leads to a medical negligence claim, they're unable to defend themselves because they don't have the requisite records. So one of the key risks in the departments of health around its financial viability is the, the prevalence of these medical negligence claims. And part of it, and research has shown that part of it can be dealt with by sorting out key disciplines at the point of treatment. Make sure that you have proper resources that are allocated to delivering services in the form of healthcare workers, in the form of med medicines, in the form of other equipment that you need. Make sure that you are recording what it is you've done with each patient and you are, you are recording the basis on which you have arrived at those decisions. So that should a claim arise, you can either settle it quickly and fairly and should a claim arise, you can manage it in terms of minimizing its impact on the individual whose, whose health has been compromised, but also its impact in terms of the financial resources that are then available to the Department of Health. So we believe that those things can be dealt with if we embrace a culture of compliance, a culture of discipline, if we put in place the key controls and procedures that allow for stability in terms of how the services are being delivered. Um, as I said, the, the other departments are really tracking well and they are moving in the right direction. The conversation can now shift in a way that's exciting and important around how we get them to deliver on their mandate. State on entities, honorable chairpersons and members uh, are a problem. Um, the, the, of, of the um, 21 major public entities listed in Schedule 2, 15 of those are audited by the AGSA. What we're seeing is that the audit outcomes are regressing, which is indicative of weaknesses in governance, in financial management disciplines, in performance reporting deficiencies, and poor, poor compliance. Of the seven audits that we completed on time, only one had a clean audit, and that was DBSA. 
a number of them were sitting either in the in the uh, qualified unqualified space. So you have Armsco, uh, Airports Company, uh, CEF, Nexa, SABC, and Safco that were competing. But in terms of what's sitting in the unqualified space, you've got AXA, the Airports Company, Armsco, CEF, and Safco. That's what's sitting in those four that make up 27%. Um, AXA, Armsco, CEF, and Safco. The ones with the qualified audit opinions are Transnet and SABC. And the one that's got the disclaimer is Nexa. The ones that are outstanding and that they've not yet been completed are uh, Post Office, uh, TCTA, Denel, SAA Group, SA Express, IGT, and Landbank. And there are a few more that are not audited by us. So the governance matters in the state-owned entities need urgent attention. The, the performance issues and the financial health needs to, to be attended to. And especially given that not just the role that they play, but also the resources that they have available to them to, to instill those key disciplines. If we look at the public entities, the smaller public entities, they're not faring better than the departments. And one would have expected that they are the ones who have the ability to hire skills that, that can do the job. They are the ones who have the space to actually put in place the controls that are necessary for them to deliver and to account transparently. And we're not seeing that. We're seeing far too many of them with audits not submitted for, with financials not submitted for audit or with orders delayed, far too many of them with disclaimer audit opinions and far too many of them not making the right transition towards the clean audit zone. The, the provincial and national outcomes, um, so we put on this slide some detail on how each of the provinces has performed. And we've looked at how they've performed year on year. So that's the, the numbers for previous year. And, and, um, and then we've also looked at how they've performed from the first year of this administration. The majority of the provinces have been making improvements in the number of audits that are moving in the right direction, except for Mpumalanga. Mpumalanga is the one that's sticky and it needs particular attention. The Western Cape retains its, its place as having the highest number of clean audits. Um, and so that's a pleasing outcome. What we're saying is that at least for most of the provinces, we're moving in the right direction. What we've now got to do is accelerate these improvements. If we look then at the next slide, and I, and I want to just make this, this slide um, one where we can make a, a very important point. When you've got scarce resources, your ability to manage them is better strengthened if you have key financial management disciplines in place, the regular reconciliations, the regular reviews, because that information allows you to course correct as things change. And our world has taught us that things can change very quickly. Budgets have to be adjusted very quickly. And if an institution doesn't have those core disciplines around decision-making based on credible information, the ability to be responsive, to be agile, to be uh, resilient, that ability is compromised. And we say this because whilst it's important to recognize and celebrate and acknowledge that you've got 71% of the auditees with credible financials that have been published, which is the point I made earlier on. When we dug deeper, we found that only 43% of these had actually been able to submit financials of good quality when the audit started. Over the course of the audit, there were corrections made. When we found errors, those corrections were made, which is a good thing. And that's why we were able to move from 43% to 71%. Had the audit office not found errors and allowed the, the opportunity to make those corrections, we would be sitting only with credible financial statements at 43%. Not only is this unsustainable, because it makes the audit process difficult and expensive, um, but it also highlights that the resilience of our institutions is not where it should be. So whilst we can celebrate the 71%, let's also attend to ensuring that those basic disciplines are put in place, because that's how we're going to make sure that we can stretch the rands we have available towards the service delivery needs. 
Performance information has a very similar profile, and I've, I've shared in the earlier slide why it's important to have performance information that is credible, because that's where you really can start the accountability discussion. If you have a credible performance report, you can then start to say to the Department of Human Settlement, your report says that you planned to, to, to deliver 100 houses. We see that you delivered only 80 houses, and yet you spent the budget. How can we figure out how we get to the next year so that you get the houses you should be delivering at the right price? What's going wrong with your budget? What's going wrong with your planning? What's going wrong with your delivery? You can have that conversation around performance and delivery. But if you don't even have credible performance information, you're always going to be talking about audit findings and audit qualifications and never shift the discussion as oversight towards performance. And so we need to get these basics right. The next slide deals with non-compliance, which really makes the point that our journey towards building institutions that embrace consistent compliance with the rules, that journey is slow. So we do need to continue to engage with all leaders that are responsible for public administration around embracing a culture of compliance and delivery and therefore accountability. A culture that builds solid institutions that are characterized by integrity. Because if we don't do this, we're going to keep having departments and entities being vulnerable to leakage, being vulnerable to instances of fraud and loss. Um, and also institutions that because they don't play within the rules or are not seen to play within the rules, have less, enjoy less and less confidence from citizens. So we do need to sort this out, especially around procurement and especially around the prevention of irregular, unauthorized and fruitless and wasteful expenditure and around consequence management. And I'm aware that often when we raise the matter about consequence management, the answer says, well, AG, you've, you've now been given powers, what have you done with them? And we'll account for that. We'll talk about what we've done with those powers in a moment. But what it tells you is that you simply can't rely on the AG and the powers that have been given to the AG to drive a change in culture and a change in discipline. All of that has got to be done by all of the role players working together, playing their different roles. The, the instances of non-compliance lead to increases in irregular expenditure. This year's accumulated irregular expenditure is at 166.85 billion, and it has been incurred by 286 auditees. Two points around this. Irregular expenditure that we are reporting on is not complete. Much as we said last year, for as long as you've got some of the auditees qualified on their ability to fully account for irregular expenditure, then you know that the number is incomplete. If you've got auditees that can't account for how much irregular expenditure they've been, they, they have uh, registered in a year, then you know that the 166 billion is not complete. This year, we had 23% of auditees, 88 auditees with a qualification on irregular expenditure. So we share the number with caution. There were also some limitations in terms of auditing procurement um, at some of the departments, and we set that out in our report. The, the other part of the story I wanted to share around irregular expenditure is that for the first time, what we're seeing is that much of the irregular expenditure that we're reporting on is not linked to procurement. At the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, they registered 77 and a half billion rand of irregular expenditure due to non-compliance with bursary regulations. So it wasn't procurement related. Quite often, we, you know, when we report on irregular expenditure, we talk a lot more about procurement. But an insight this year is that this one was not uh, procurement related. It's important that we embrace a culture of compliance and disciplines of compliance and playing within the rules whether it is so far as procurement is concerned or any other way that we engage with public finances. 
The financial health status of many departments and uh, public entities is worrying, and we've said this for, for many years, and the story this year is no different. We're seeing ongoing pressure in terms of the financial viability of departments, public entities, and state-owned entities. The state-owned entities, that story is often very well documented, with many of them relying on government uh, for, for guarantees uh, and bailouts. So that story is, is pretty well documented. Last year, we also talked about how public entities, the smaller entities, ought not to be ignored when we talk about financial health, because we're seeing more and more of them with indications that they are under financial health pressure. Amongst the departments, the ones that show the greatest pressure remain, as they did in the previous year, remain health and education, because that's where you're seeing high levels of unauthorized expenditure because they are operating out of budget. Uh, that's where you're seeing high accruals in that they are struggling to pay their creditors on time because they're running out of cash and are waiting for the following year's budget. And also in the Department of Health, that's where you've got uh, the impact of those medical negligence claims, which then make it difficult for the departments to fill vacancies because they have to pay out the, the uh, court ordered um, settlement. Um, and then they, 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 so then what they then, is, then do is they don't fill key vacancies and then they don't do the infrastructure maintenance that needs to be made. So as a result, the ability to deliver services going forward is compromised because they've had to pay for the historical claims. Not much you can do about minimizing the exposure that's there other than managing the cases that are already there. What's critical is to um, minimize the incidents that result in those claims to improve the quality of services that are available at the points of care. We have in our report, honorable chairpersons and members, and this report will be available to you as soon as we've tabled it today. We tabled it today. It's a report we are particularly proud of. And so I would invite all of you to take some time over the course of the holidays, maybe, to read our report. It's an interactive one. It's got a wealth of information. Um, some of the things I've spoken about, but much deeper insight. Um, and I want to give credit to the teams at the Office of the AG who have done phenomenal work in getting us there. So our report this time around sets out some key insights. And I don't know if Honorable Singh is on the line, but he will enjoy these insights because here we have taken the performance auditors and we've done performance audits on a number of projects in the key service delivery department. So this audit report gives you the insights, honorable saying that you've been calling for around performance audit. We looked at how infrastructure grants were being, uh, were being spent in the sector for human settlements, in the basic education sector around the school's infrastructure backlog, we looked at the um, building of schools themselves. Uh, we also looked at the revitalization of health facilities, that are, uh, which are projects that are being rolled out by, num by a number of the provincial departments of health. What we're seeing, and, and the report sets out in, in very graphic terms some examples of specific projects with even pictures to really make the point. But what we're seeing, in essence, is that the same message that we've been driving about key controls around project management, that message remains relevant. There are inadequate needs assessments and project planning disciplines. There is ineffective monitoring of project milestones. Um, there, there is underperformance by contractors and they're not being held accountable. Um, and we're also finding that because contractors are not paid on time, then there's, there's, um, they stand still in terms of the project and then there are penalties that are incurred by, by the department. And we're also seeing that sometimes the coordination and the collaboration between different institutions in government, sometimes that fails and, and, and it results in project management deficiencies and it, it, it results in delayed completion of projects um, or even projects that are commissioned, um, but, uh, that are completed but are not yet commissioned because there's some or other problem in terms of um, other functions. Because of the same weaknesses, we're seeing delayed completion, we're seeing project costs increasing, with, uh, resulting in financial losses, and we're also seeing uh, quality defects in the projects that are being implemented. And the impact really is about wastage, it's about 
poor quality infrastructure, which diminishes the ability of the state to use the infrastructure that they're investing in for, for, for a considerable period. It also makes it difficult for citizens to enjoy access to the facilities that are now being put in place. So that those same disciplines need significant attention. We also, uh, honorable members, sh share in our report some key insights about what we've seen around the public work sector. Um, and, and, and what tends to go wrong insofar as facilities management, the, the management of leases, and the management of infrastructure projects. Reading this chapter will give you a good sense on why public servants complain about the conditions under which they operate, whether they are in um, the, the offices from which they operate, whether they are in the healthcare facilities, whether they are in the schools. It'll give you a good story about what goes wrong. It'll also give you a good story about why we end up with these really expensive leases, privately owned buildings that we are overpaying for because we're not managing the, the lease contracts appropriately. Um, so I really would encourage the honorable members to, to read that report. The essence of our message is that we've got to accelerate accountability improvements so that we can deliver services and essentially serve the citizens of South Africa. We've got to make sure that all of the executives and the accounting officers and accounting authorities have got performance measures that are geared towards driving a change in behavior so that we get better accountability. We've got to make sure that there is better coordination, monitoring, and corrective action where intergovernmental systems don't work. We've got to make sure that there are sustainable solutions through preventative controls, and we've got to lead by example in effecting consequence management. To that end, as an audit office, we'll continue to do our part. Um, last year, you would have seen we even launched a preventative controls guide. This year, today, we're also launching a guide that can help accounting officers and executive authorities and probably even the portfolio committees in parliament to oversee infrastructure projects. So yet another contribution by the audit office in terms of accelerating accountability improvements. My last point, honorable chairpersons, relates to the MI powers. The honorable members are only too aware of the powers. You know very well what it is they are. Um, I, will, I will just reiterate one point, which is that these MI powers are complementary in that they can support what other actors in the accountability ecosystem do. The AGSA doesn't take over the responsibilities of accounting authorities um, and accounting officers who must be supported by the internal auditors and audit committees in doing what's necessary. It does, we don't take over the role of executive authorities that are meant to supervise accounting officers. We don't take the role of the legislators that are meant to, to oversee what's being done by accounting officers and, and accounting authorities. We similarly don't take over the, the, the roles and responsibilities of the public bodies, the state agencies that are tasked with investigations, recovery and prosecutions. The very best we can do is do our part and collaborate with all of the other actors. We see this tool as one that certainly can help us to shift the culture within um, the public sector, drive better compliance, drive better corrective actions, and drive better and stronger and more visible consequences when things have gone wrong. So that over time, we get better performance and resilience of public sector institutions. Honorable Chairpersons, we've given you the report that sets out what we've done in terms of implementing these powers. You recall that we, we did this in a phased approach. When the law was promulgated in April of 2019, we started off with a small number of auditees, um, 16 for PFMA and nine for MFMA, so that was 25. So that was just about two years ago, two and a half years ago. Then we increased it in the 2020 cycle to 146, being 89 for PFMA and 57 for MFMA. Uh, and then this year, what we've done is increase it to 93 for, M for PFMA and 82 for MFMA, uh, being a total of 175 audit teams. And next year, we'll ramp it up again quite significantly. What it means is that our audit teams are getting better at this. They are learning and they're growing and they're deepening the work that we do in the space. In the first year, we also took a component of the definition 
And then we broadened it in the second year somewhat. And then in the third year, we took on the full definition. What it tells you then is that for the very first time in the 2021 audit cycle, we've had the benefit of the full definition um, being applied to how we're implementing these powers. Rome was not built in one day. Um, and as I say, we are learning, we are building the capabilities and we are deepening our relationships and collaboration with other actors in the space. Over the time that we've been implementing these powers, we have uh, reported on 237 material irregularities. And this is now for a combination of PFMA and MFMA. Of those, 17 have been closed or resolved. And an MI is closed or resolved where after we have issued it to the, to the accounting officer, they do what's, what's required. They investigate, they get the money back if they can. Sometimes they can't and then we close the issue, but at least they investigate, they sort out the controls and they discipline their staff. Um, and then we still got 220 MIs that remain unresolved. In the report that we shared with you, we set out in detail a number of these MIs. What I will say is that they really cover the same ground that I've just been talking about in terms of the audit outcomes. It's about procurement um, uh, problems. It's about payment cycles where we end up paying for goods or services that are not received, um, where we pay for um, standing time because we're not managing projects properly or interest and penalties because we're not even managing the little cash resources we have appropriately. We're seeing some instances of fraud and, 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 and compliance problems that, that lead to loss. We're also seeing revenue management controls being a problem. We're seeing resource management being a problem. And we've also issued some MIs to a number of municipalities where we saw that they were having repeat disclaimers. And all of the weaknesses that led to the disclaimers were having a direct impact on the institution as well as on the public. The matters that we've raised, we believe can be resolved if there is a swift attention paid to strengthening controls, especially in the area of SCM and project management. What we've seen is in the vast majority of instances, accounting officers are responding. They respond by instituting investigations, by acting on them and by re recovering losses and fixing controls. What we would want to call for is that executive authorities monitor the completion, the timely completion of investigations and action thereon and active recovery. We also would want to appeal to oversight to also support the journey of strengthening the public bodies that are charged with investigation and law enforcement so that they too can play their role. There are a number of, of, of MIs, for example, where we are waiting for the state attorney to do its part in terms of recovery. We are waiting for the completion of um, the, the processes by the Hawks and the SIU. We were waiting for accounting officers to have access to reports for investigations that are conducted by others. So we would appeal that where we have highlighted MIs, those that oversee the other public bodies attend to um, supporting them and supervising them to getting them to do their part. Some in insight on the type of things we, we have found. Um, as I said, in the vast majority of cases, we're finding that accounting officers are, are doing what it is they're supposed to do. Um, in some cases, we've closed because the, the matters have been resolved, and others we have referred to either the NPA, the, the Hawks, um, to the SIU, uh, to the National Treasury for investigation as well. I'll give a couple of examples on, on the type of things we see. Um, at the Department of, uh, of Defense, we have already issued no less than five material irregularities relating to different transactions. The responsiveness at the Department of Defense has been one that led us to a point where we have even issued a remedial action, which is a step up even from recommendations. So at the Department of, of, of Defense, these five MIs are in different phases of being dealt with, but we've already issued remedial action insofar as at least one transaction is concerned. And the reason we've raised that remedial action is because when we found the irregularity, we notified the accounting officer. 
Um, and then they investigated. Well, first off, they, they, before investigation, they started off by saying, well, they do not believe that the non-compliance applies. So then we, we got the National Treaty to confirm that our understanding of this non-compliance was valid, and that was done. And then we issued a recommendation on the actions that the accounting officer should take. And this is now the next step as set out in our powers. When we then went back to check whether or not they'd implemented our firm recommendations, we found that they had not done so, certainly not adequately. So what we've now done is issued binding remedial action. And we're now awaiting the deadline for them to complete the implementation of that, of that uh, binding remedial action, which would include recovery of loss, but also includes, importantly, disciplining the staff members that are, that are, that are responsible for it. At PRASA, for example, that's another space where we've issued binding remedial action. At PRASA, there are no less than nine material irregularities that have been issued, most of them in the area of compliance in, with procurement. We have got these MIs sitting in different parts or phases of the journey. There we've issued one binding remedial action. Some are sitting in as recommendations, others are still being assessed in terms of the response from the accounting officer. But we've issued at least one binding remedial action. The reason we did that is because when we issued a material irregularity notification to that board, the accounting authority, and this was in relation to um, non-compliance on procurement matters related to the SWIFAMBO transactions. We issued the MI notification. We then allowed time for investigations to be done. Those investigations were completed. We then issued recommendations to say, now you've got to take the following action. Those actions were not implemented as we expected, certainly not adequately. So what we then did is now we have issued binding remedial action in the hands of that accounting authority. And now the next step is to see how they implement that action. If they do not implement that action in a way that is adequate and appropriate, then we will get into the next phase of the journey around uh, going towards a certificate of debt. For us, issuing certificates of debt, we don't believe is the full measure of success around this instrument. We believe that the moment calls for all accounting officers to move swiftly as soon as they have a material irregularity. And for all executive authorities that supervise them to supervise them such that they actually implement the necessary actions when we have issued a material irregularity. And for parliament and provincial legislatures to drive the accountability process so that we never get to a certificate of debt. We won't hesitate to get there if we need to. However, what we see as success is when we would have better accountability, better systems that support accountability, uh, better protection of resources such that we have controls and disciplines and a culture of working in a way that's prudent when we manage public resources. We believe that success will be had when we have enhanced the performance and the integrity of public institutions and therefore strengthened those institutions such that citizens are able to see and genuinely believe that those institutions and the people that have been appointed to lead them are actually acting in their service. My last and final point is this, which is our call to action for yourselves as the honorable members of parliament charged with oversight responsibilities. We believe that it would certainly drive the right behavior and make a big contribution to accelerating accountability. If oversight engages with accounting officers and accounting authorities, as well as with executive authorities on the MIs that we've issued. So we've given you a full list of those MIs. If you're able to share them amongst your portfolio committees or even through SCOPA and other committees, if you're able to make sure that any accounting officer that appears in front of you or any accounting authority that appears in front of you accounts properly for how they've dealt with all of the AG findings, including an MI, then we'll get better resolution for these things. 
And we also would encourage oversight to use the information that's in the audit reports to, to then gain insights about the nature and the circumstances of each and every one of the MIs. Our teams at the, audit of the, audit, at the Office of the Auditor General are always available to brief yourselves as honorable chairpersons and members on the detail that's sitting in our reports so that you can be equipped to exercise your oversight responsibilities. And we also would want to encourage oversight to monitor the corrective action that's being taken by the people that have been appointed as stewards of a public fund. Honorable Chairpersons, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share this report with you, to share these insights with you. Uh, I will say once again, our report is a great read. It is interactive. In it, you will find rich insights on each of the matters I've raised including something that I didn't talk about, which is a reconciliation of how that 500 billion of the COVID-19 expenditures was actually spent up until the end of March, 2021. And I'm quite sure that the honorable members would find that part of the report of great interest. Thank you very much. I hand back to you, honorable chair. Thank you very much, uh, uh, AG. Um, my honourable members, uh, that's, that's the report. Um, in, indeed, it's a very detailed um, uh, outcome uh, for uh, an account uh, for the year 20, uh, 2021, which brings in light uh, a number of instances uh, ending up with a material uh, nature uh, of uh, those areas which ought to be uh, observed by various departments and entities. And for us who are sitting in the benches uh, to ensure accountability and oversight, uh, those are the matters which are very critical in nature um, to look into how the uh, binding actions as recommended are thoroughly uh, fulfilled uh, by those responsible um, accounting authorities and accounting officers. Um, that's the report, uh, and uh, for us to um, ask some questions of clarity on the report, and uh, uh, maybe, uh, in fact, not maybe, uh, we're in at some stage uh, as two committees, whether um, as uh, uh, individual committees or several, uh, we could uh, have uh, some clear uh, way forward in terms of dealing with the report and um, ensure uh, that indeed <clears throat> there is uh, accountability for actions taken and actions which are not necessarily taken in accordance uh, with a prudent uh, financial management and effecting uh, a proper um, observance uh, of the law and regulations at all times uh, to expand uh, the public resources. Thank you very much, uh, uh, AG, again. And uh, can we leave that to uh, our honorable members to ask uh, questions of clarity uh, going forward? Thank you very much. Uh, it's to you, colleagues. Back to you, colleagues. Um, I, see, I see one hand from Zolam Lenzana and uh, the noise of my uh, dear colleague uh, Matafa, uh, from uh, the screen here, let me check on my gadget, uh, the practice uh, from another committee uh, is to look, can, it, can I give uh, to uh, Honorable uh, Melanzana, uh, there's, there's uh, um, Honorable Famina, uh, who's going to be the third, uh, a third hand. As, as I see from um, the, the gadget itself. Honorable Lanzana. Oh, yes, thanks. Uh, th thanks, Chairperson, and uh, good morning, uh, AG and the team. Uh, greetings to colleagues uh, and uh, everybody in the platform. Uh, let me let me join you, Chairperson, in welcoming this report. 
uh, and also indicate that uh, as uh, the AG was saying, we, we need time to go through the report and uh, after which then we'll be able to, to reflect uh, as to what is it particularly in terms of way forward. Uh, but, but then, uh, Chair, if uh, I can check with the office of the AG, the, the relationship between uh, AGSA and uh, that department uh, within the presidency uh, called monitoring and evaluation, how often do they meet? Uh, if, if not, I would then encourage that there be that constant interaction between the two uh, so that uh, the left knows what the right is doing. I understand that AG has got that element of being uh, independent by virtue of uh, its constitutional imperative and uh, M&E is within the presidency. I understand that, but I'm encouraging Chair that uh, working together. Then AG, I am not sure you will bear with me if it is too much. We are now at a uh, 2021 and uh, the, the financial year is ending 2022 would it be too much for me uh, to ask if we can uh, as you are talking accelerated accountability but now coin it and give it some time frame that let's let let's launch uh, an accelerated ac ac uh, accelerated accountability towards uh, a clean audit 2024. Uh, I want us to, to to put some time frames here, if possible, AG, understanding that it will be only two years towards uh, the end of uh, the financial year 2024, which I think it will be March. 2024. I'm not sure if we are able to do that. I'm raising this, uh, Chairperson, appreciating uh, this increase in terms of the margin to 70% uh, in terms of performance of uh, the auditees. Uh, that what I have in mind perhaps is something which is workable and doable, in fact. If all uh, you know, hands to be on deck and we all put our, our, our shoulders on the wheel, pushing towards the realization of a, a clean audit uh, within all our auditees. I, I'm raising this uh, chairperson and uh, AG, mindful of the fact that there is this tone which is concerning all of us uh, about, uh, I'm not calling these repeat uh, disclaimers. I'm calling them Chaperson serial uh, disclaimers because they are killing uh, the nation. Uh, particularly if you would have uh, people who refuse uh, to come to the party. I had a question, but then I, I've since withdrawn that. But uh, if AG fails, she could come in because she indicated some part. Uh, I, I had a question if uh, the AGSA has now started biting because we, give, we gave them diff uh, through legislation. But towards the end of the report, uh, I could I could uh, see that something is being done, uh, but but then if AG wants to put some emphasis and more clarity uh, on the remedial actions that have been taken, she's free. But uh, the reason that I deleted that question, Chair, I felt that it is somehow addressed towards the end of the presentation. Thanks, uh, Chairperson, and once more, welcome this. Uh, 
presentation by the Office of the AG. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mlanzana. Uh, Honorable Matafa, we are going to follow, but can we give it to the AG uh, for those areas of clarity? AG. Um, Honourable Chair, um, I, I do think it, it, it would be useful um, maybe for us to reconvene when the Honourable Members have had a chance to read the report and then we can have a, a deeper discussion. Um, but in terms of the specific questions around the DPME, uh, I welcome the uh, the recommendation from Honourable Mlenz and, and I want to assure you that that's certainly something we will do uh, to meet more often than we do already with DPME and to interact and collaborate more effectively because yes, as independent as we are as an audit office, our role is to support the system as it shifts towards better accountability and transparency. So we will certainly be taking that on. Um, the 2024 target, I think it's something worth pursuing um, and, and to shape it, not purely as let's chase clean audits, but to shape it as let's do better. Let's all do better. If you're in a disclaimer, get out of there. If you're in unqualified, get out of there. If you're in qualified, get out of there. If you're in clean audit, do better. If you're a provincial treasury who's got a clean audit, do better. So I would couch it in, let's all do more good. Let's all do better. Um, and I agree with you on the serial disclaimers. I think we ought not to tolerate them um, as, as anymore. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's really, um, worth paying attention to and get all of those out of that space because there's certainly no need for us to continue to tolerate that. Thank you very much, Jack. Honorable Matafa. Thank you very much, Chair. Good uh, morning to yourself and the uh, AG. Actually, it's afternoon. Good afternoon. And to all the honorable members on the platform. Now, Chair, Honorable uh, Mlenzana, because uh, my first question would have been around the interface between the AGSA's office and the shareholder ministry. But I see he brought in the element of DPME, which answers my question and subsequently nullifies other questions. But I will also maybe pose the question in terms of how I would have made my notes. And, and maybe if um, the AG feels that in responding to Honorable Mlenza, and I should have responded to my question, then it's fine. But if maybe there is other additional information that she can give, I'll be gladly, uh, she can gladly uh, do so. And, and thank you for the presentation. The, the, the reports are very detailed and indeed, they will assist us to perform the oversight that we have to do going forward. Chair, the question would have been, I wanted to understand the interface between the office and the shareholder ministries as it relates to entities. Like for example, PRASA will fall under transport. The NEL SAA will fall under public enterprises. So now in the audit period, as the audit process unfolds, is there an interface between the AG office as well as these particular ministries? The reason I'm asking, Chair, is that in one of our departmental briefings in the other committee that myself and Comrade Mulenzana find ourselves, the SCOA, one of the entities that is always in the news in the form of the NEL, reported that there is a failure from management to implement the, the, the approved turnaround plan. Now, why I'm asking this question, Chair, is because immediately there is a failure to implement a turnaround plan in your own operations. Chances are that you will find it also difficult to comply with auditing processes. Because my view and my understanding is that processes like audits are led at the managerial level. So the second question that will come with the interface 
is to ask if whether when the AG picks up managerial deficiencies, is there a way that such can be communicated to cabinet or to our committee so that as we do oversight, you are able to speak also to the strengthening and capacitation of this particular management structures that should exist where, where, where they do not. So that is the first question in terms of the interface around these particular entities. You can draw SAA in as well. You can look at SABC. You can look at Transnet in terms of how we can uh, respond to, to this question. Now, in the same vein, Chair, we, we welcome the 115 clean audits, but also note that 18 had lost the clean audit status. Now, the question there would be, in the 115, are there similarities in terms of how these particular auditees conduct their affairs in a manner that this particular operations can be summarized somewhere and classified as best practice. Maybe as and when the AG is proceeding with auditing other auditees, they are able to say, based on the 19% of the national budget that was spent in a clean and acceptable manner, if maybe you consider the following particular methods of management, they might assist those other entities that we are identifying as those that can uh, be escalated or elevated to a status of a clean audit. Those will, will be my two questions, Chair. The one of repeat disclaimers was uh, well responded to by the AG when she responded to Honorable Mlenzana. I will pause there, Chair. I think all other questions were disabled by the DPME curveball that Colonel Mlenzana threw into the question. But thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in the discussion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, Matasa AG. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you very much, Honorable Machafa. The, I'll expand a little bit on the DPME story. Some time ago, the Office of the AG started a journey of reviewing the annual performance plans of departments ahead of the approval by Parliament. And we were doing that to support parliamentarians to at least approve APPs that were well poised to drive effective delivery, but importantly, we're also well poised to deal with audit outcomes so that they can fix things before they become problematic. Um, we've been doing that for a while. What we are now talking to DPME about is how we can collaborate so that we don't duplicate efforts, but also we time our work in a way that's going to um, help them also do what they need to do. So we're looking actively at how we can collaborate better, especially for the forthcoming financial year. The, the point you make about the engagements with the, with the shareholder departments, that does happen as a matter of course. So the minister responsible for, for any of these entities would have ample opportunity, and they do, they have ample opportunity to engage in, with our teams and hear from them. Um, and um, we, we will continue to, to do that. S similarly, accounting offices as well. What we're seeing is that the attention to these entities tends to slip. Um, and what we're wanting to do is make sure that we put them back to the center of our engagements with accounting officers, executive authorities, but also with the legislatures. Best practice guides. Um, the honorable members may recall that last year we issued the preventative controls guides. We published those towards the end of 2020. And we made them available to be used by members of parliament, um, as well as the accounting officers themselves uh, and the executive authorities. Today, we will be publishing an infrastructure management guide. And it's a preventative controls guide building onto what we've already got in place to help anybody who has responsibilities around managing infrastructure projects to do so in a way that's consistent with best practice as we've seen it. So, so I think the, these um, tools and instruments are being made available by the audit office um, and we'll make sure that everybody who has an interest in this work has access to that information. Um, and we believe it's a, it's a good contribution that the office can make 
in, in supporting the acceleration of accountability improvements. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, AJ. Honorable Famila. Thank you very much, Chair. Am I to understand from the AG, and, and if so, it'll be the second time we've heard this in 24 hours, essentially, that there are delays when it comes to not just consequence management, but to investigations from other agencies, including uh, the NPA. And can we please have clarity on that? Because if that is the case, it's something that we are urgently going to have to start taking up. Thank you. Yes, AG, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member AG. Thank you very much, Honorable Minan and Honorable Pearson. Uh, yes, there are delays in, in dealing with some of the matters that we have raised, whether it's with the Hawks, with the NPA, um, and with other actors. And it may well be it's a capacity issue, it's a prioritization issue. There may be a whole host of reasons for, for why these delays are there. Um, in our report that we, we tabled today, we set out in great detail each and every one of the MIs and what the status is. Um, so as you can see where the, 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 the blockages tend to be. Um, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why our message is that for executive authorities that oversee and supervise the different public bodies, to pay attention to these MIs and the processing of these MIs. Um, so for example, the state attorney is, is another area where we find a blockage in terms of pursuing matters, especially around recovery. Um, we are also finding that um, it's an opportunity for us to equip uh, the honorable members of parliament with key insights on specific matters that they can then follow up when they have any of these public bodies appearing in front of them for part of the as part of the accountability mechanisms. Thank you very much. Thanks, AG Honorable Hadebe. Thank you, um, Honorable the Chairperson. Um, I would also like to welcome the report, Chair. I've got few clarity seeking questions. Uh, the first one relates to the government printing works. Um, AG, you said the reason why there's a delay, it's because of data loss. I'm curious, uh, what type of data um, are we talking about here? Because we dealing with the printing works of government and the sensitive information that that uh, entity um, holds. So if I can just get clarity on, on, on that one. Um, secondly, Chair, I started to be excited when I saw the figures of clean audit, but that excitement was short-lived when I further read the, the presentation uh, from 2018, 2019, we've seen a 20 number of increases in terms of clean audit. However, there are 18 uh, departments uh, or entities that have lost the audit, the clean audit status. I'm interested, AG, in knowing what are the main reason for that regression and have they regressed from clean to unqualified or is it from clean to qualified or uh, adverse? If we can just get that understanding, I'm very interested in understanding the reasons. So in essence, one cannot uh, view this as an improvement. It appears as if we're going around the cycle. Those that achieve clean audit, they are unable to maintain or sustain. Only 86 uh, departments or state-owned entities are, have successfully able to sustain uh, the status of clean audit. All what we want to see moving forward is a sustained. And at this current juncture, it's only 86. So that we withdraw lessons from those that are failing to uh, uh, maintain they are clean audit status. Um, Chair, I think others will deal with 
uh, in house. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm curious, uh, I was expecting to see ESCOM featuring here, but I'm mindful of the fact that uh, the Auditor General does not audit ESCOM. Uh, are these entities and departments that have been presented here include only those that are audited by you or you've included all the departments and, and, uh, and entities, including those that you do not audit? There are serious challenges there in ESCOM. I was just curious and hoping you'd highlight some of the, as you did with Prasa and others. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> AG. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, Honorable Hadebe is, look, is longing for the day when the AG will audit all of these entities. Um, and, and you'll recall, Honorable Hadebe, that we've been taking them on um, systematically over a number of years now. Um, ESCOM, we have not yet taken over. Similarly, broadband, infraco, as well as IDC, for example, we don't audit those. Um, so we don't include them in, in, in these slides. However, our report does give you some insight on the outcomes of those different um, entities. Um, but, you know, we, as I say, we haven't, we haven't yet taken over those audits. The honorable members of parliament get the benefit of briefings by the team from the AGSA together with the appointed private sector auditor on the outcomes of those entities, uh, because we, we see our responsibility as being, cover, as being to cover the entire base of public sector departments and entities. On the department side, we cover everything. It's just the entities, the bigger entities that we've been taking on systematically for the last, um, I'd say 10 years and, and probably uh, at a very fast pace in the latter three, uh, in the latter six or seven years. Uh, government printing works, the, the loss, the data loss related to predominantly financial information. So it was really about their accounting systems as I've understood. The regression from clean audit, it tends to now go into the unqualified zone. So um, I'll give you an example, now that we're talking about entities. Armscore used to have a clean audit, so they were in the clean audit last year. This time around, they are in the unqualified with findings. And their main problem was that they slipped on their discipline of managing their financial reports, so that by the time we started to audit, we found errors. And that's a non-compliance, because the PFMA specifically provides that the accounting officer and the accounting authority must put in place systems, strong systems, that guarantee that you will have access to credible financial information on an ongoing basis. Now, when they don't do that, and it results in them submitting to us financials that have material errors, then it tells us that they've not complied with the PFMA requirement in the, uh, for, for that specific issue. That's what happened in arms school. Because they run manual systems, they slipped in terms of their reconciliations, and then they ended up with errors. What it tells us around these regressions or the lack of stability at the clean audit level is that the stability of controls, the, the predict, predictability of disciplines within how finances are managed, that's not yet firm. So part of our preventative controls guide is to help executive authorities as well as the portfolio committees to keep accounting officers focused on ongoing strengthening of the systems of accountability and transparency so that you not only get a clean audit, but you continue to get that clean audit. Because we, we always say as an audit office, it's, it's difficult to earn a clean audit, but probably more difficult to maintain it. And when you maintain it, it tells us that your systems are pretty stable and it takes time to build that. Uh, and so public institutions and those that run them have to be incentivized, inspired, and monitored to ensure that they continue on the journey of building strong, stable systems. When we did the audit, and my, my last point on this one is that when we did the audit, my team said to me that they found 24 audits, which were very close to clean audits. Initially, they said that it was 31 clean audits, 31 audits that were close to clean. When they dug a bit deeper, they said, of those 31, 
24 missed the clean audit outcome simply because their financial records, their financial information was not credible. They corrected that information whilst we were auditing, but it was not credible from the start. So again, it tells us the stability of financial management is not quite there. Um, you might recall that slide that I shared where we talked about how only 43% of auditees had credible financial statements when we started the audit, and that many of them used the audit process to correct misstatements to get to the 71% with, with credible financial information. And that's the issue, that we've got to get the disciplines of regular preparation of credible financial statements right. Thank you very much. Thank you, AG. Uh, Honorable Sipo Sondre. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I would also like to um, thank uh, the, the Auditor General for the helpful report which they presented this morning. And also to say that it's, this is um, actually even more empowering, but it's very important for a follow-up meeting. Like she, she said, she's available to engage more on um, the follow-up meeting on this report. Um, we, when we talk uh, clean audits, I think it's also very important that we need to see if that clean audit speak to service delivery right on the ground. Um, so most of the issues which I wanted to raise has already been raised by, by other people who spoke before me. But coming to service delivery, uh, we speak about um, issues of clinics in the communities. Those are some areas which are still a matter of concern. Uh, opening of those clinics in four hours, if there are medicine in, in, in the clinics, the hospitals, public hospitals, and not only the Department of Health, but it means as, the, as members of uh, portfolio committees or as oversight, we need to have more vigorous um, um, a visit, spot, I mean, a visit to, to the sites to see if those thin audits are really, really talking to service delivery on the ground. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Sapasengwe. I, I take it that you are perfectly uh, comfortable that matters have been raised by other uh, members. I think what is uh, only left, AG, is the fact that you have raised a matter, uh, some matters of difference. Mm -hmm. AG, you have raised matters of a difference between yourself and some oddities, uh, which are clarified between um, what you uh, are auditing and the Department uh, of National uh, Treasury in terms of those uh, opera operating standards and procedures. How is it uh, that you would uh, effect some perfection um, on such a, a interaction. I see there the Western Cape, the two, two um, uh, departments we have uh, that uh, a kind of engagement. As a result, their audit uh, has been delayed. And uh, secondly, on that, how is the Office of the Accountant General um, uh, collaborates uh, with your office in terms of finalization of matters that relate to um, effective um, uh, standard procedure uh, for the actual uh, audit and finalization of such audits. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, the Office of the Accountant General remains vacant. Uh, there hasn't been an Accountant General for several years now. Um, and, and what we're seeing is that when we audit and, and we come up to areas of judgment and when we differ with, with, with the, the audit team, um, when we had a, an accountant general in place, 
it was relatively efficient and effective in terms of resolving those 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 areas of dispute um, because as you would imagine the, the process of auditing is one where we test compliance against the norms and standards that the national treasury has set up uh, and the national treasury has that specific duty to set up those norms and standards given by the constitution so that's their role ours is to test whether government departments and entities have complied with those with those norms and standards when there is a lack of clarity around those norms and standards then we end up with these disputes and it's important for us to go back to the treasury and confirm the correctness of our interpretation when I spoke about one of the MIs, I talked about how we had to go to the National Treasury when the Department of Defense disagreed with us. We went to the Treasury and asked, you know, who's correct in, in terms of the intent that you had when you set up this, this particular regulation. And when they were able to confirm, we could move. When they take time to confirm, it does make our lives difficult. And we believe that one of the key things to be sorted out is is that vacant role of the Office of the Accountant General. Uh, there, there are two other matters. So, so if you look at the list of outstanding audits, you'll see the Road Accident Fund, which is one of the audits that has been um, delayed. The Road Accident Fund submitted their financials on, on the 31st of May as required in law. However, as we sit today, that audit has not been signed off for the simple reason that there is a dispute around the accounting treatment of a particular set of obligations or liabilities. The Road Accident Fund changed their accounting policy. We believe that the way their accounting is inappropriate. And when we wanted to then finalize the audit, it was important for us to then go to the Treasury to help us figure out who is correct. One might argue that the AG just go ahead and conclude on your own. However, it's important for us to make sure that the National Treasury, with their specific responsibilities given in law, are part of the journey of concluding on matters that are material for how the financial accounting and reporting systems in the public sector operate. Um, so my answer, Honorable Chair, is that if we can sort out the vacancy in the Office of the Accountant General, it would make the audit process much easier and, more, and, and much quicker so that oversight mechanisms can kick into place. It would give the important certainty to not just the office of the AG, but to all of the auditees, regardless of where they sit, so that there is stability in terms of how financial reporting ought to happen, in terms of even how the interpretation of regulations around reporting or even around procurement needs to to be to be made so that that's the answer honorable chair it, it, it's one of the features for our report this year as you see with these outstanding audits it's one of the features for our experience uh, over the past couple of years as we've audited and it's really reaching a point that um need, where it needs greater attention thank you chair Thank you very much, uh, AG. That's a sticky point, I think, which we need to uh, take forward with the uh, with Treasury, um, because in the absence uh, of that office, uh, things might uh, fall apart uh, at the uh, Auditor General's effecting um, the mandate uh, quite appropriately. I, I, I think we really need to make that point sink um, at the level of the uh, Treasury uh, uh, Office. Thank you very much for that uh, answer. I see a hand which yes, is I left out two questions. Lang no, 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 no. Honorable Shangwa. Um, thank you very much, uh, Bob Somio. And uh, well, one must um, thank the, 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 the AG and her team uh, for a job well done yet again. Um, and I think largely the work now falls on us to follow up uh, with um, the, the hearings and will probing the matters further. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I just have a few uh, issues uh, 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 which maybe I'd like to crave the indulgence of the AG. Um, we, we, are, we are settled with clearly a problem in the SOE sector. 
um, which year on year is increasingly becoming worse. Um, and the, the reasons for that are far and varied. But AG, realistically speaking, um, the one fundamental question which lingers is, is the PFMA uh, suitable uh, for SOEs in its current form in the sense that uh, SOEs have got a dual broad mandate, one of course, uh, or maybe Outlook, one day in SOE, but the flip side of that coin is that they're operating in a business environment uh, where business agility um, and flexibility may be required in order to compete favorably um, with the competitors, whether you're looking at um, SAA with competing with Flash Affair, uh, British Airways, Comair, and Lyft and the likes here in South Africa, and the SABC competing with Newsroom Africa and ENCA. Um, and, with, and then the list is, just goes on. Um, and so I would really hope we can have a discussion about, about, about that as to whether we, we will be able to get to where we want to get. You look at the post office headache, competing with Postnet and all the other courier services that are around and already they want to implement a turnaround strategy of um, 8 billion rands. I say this AG because I think we must avoid for all intents and purposes, throwing financial solutions to non-financial problems. Um, and so I'm quite certain that you, you and your team are in a better position to have a, a broader assessment as to whether the PFMA allows uh, for the kind of business agility which is required in order for uh, these businesses to actually go the whole nine yards on behalf of, of, of the state. Um, and of course, then there's the issues of compliance, which are non-negotiable in that space, which generally, of course, we would expect you to make the necessary findings on that. And so my question doesn't uh, seek to absolve compliance um, currently, but I'm just looking at the broader technical difficulty which prevails um, in that space. Um, the second point, um, AG, is the ESCOM headache. Uh, if my recollection serves me well, mm -hmm. uh, there was a outlook to say that we must, the AG must take over um, ESCOM over, and a five-year period was set into motion in that regard. Um, and so if we can get an update as really as to um, how, 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 how that transition is, is, is actually um, uh, going. So that's, that's, that's the second um, point. Um, and then uh, AG, I think we are settled with a disclaimer again with um, the compensation fund. And this has been, a reality with us now for close to a decade. Um, and so I really hope we can um, have a, I think we need to press the reset button in terms of what's actually going on at the compensation fund. Um, of course, we've ordered and directed that a forensic investigation must actually take place. Um, uh, the, but uh, it, 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 it may only serve to uncover uh, what is the root cause, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite concerned about the audit action plan um, that is, is uh, being employed there, well, supposed to be employed rather. Compensation fund amongst others, is one of the worst uh, of offenders. So I think um, that is that that is one that um, we have to look at. Um, and then the the final point I may come back at here. And then the final point for now is is, is on the critical issue of uh, parliamentary legislature oversight. Um, and 
I think that uh, the, the AG must uh, be given the latitude uh, to be frank with us uh, as to whether in so far as the assurance provider context is concerned, how is parliament and the legislatures faring? Uh, because I want to just let on to what she said about the material irregularities being one aspect in the expanded mandate of the PAA, that all the stakeholders need to actually put shoulder to the wheel. I'm paraphrasing uh, what she said, but she was along those lines. And I think the, 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 the honest discussion has to be had as to whether uh, parliament in its entirety and the line function committee specifically and the legislatures, so including SCOPA, uh, probably more than any other committee, as to whether we are actually uh, adding value and where we can improve. Because the dilemma we are faced with is that the AG will come into audit and then the, they come into audit again. And we, 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 we are probably in more ways than one part and parcel of the machinery of how these things operate and are done during the course of the year so that we can be able to reflect correctly and press the reset button. And I think uh, the AG must be candid uh, with us uh, and where we are falling short, she must put that to us so that we ourselves um, can actually be, uh, can improve uh, in, 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 in what you're doing. I'll stop there um, for now, Chen. I know AG, you are looking for Mr. Singh, your good friend. Uh, he's actually in the Chief Whips Forum, but he will definitely uh, join in. So he um, tendered his apology on that regard. Abusami, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable uh, Sangwa. And um, uh, to, to the AG, you would uh, probably appreciate that some of the questions uh, would require uh, as some members have already proposed, uh, that uh, time ought to be given for further interrogation of the report and therefore um, a second bite in, in a meeting form where uh, the depth of such uh, questions uh, would uh, relate to uh, the AG's uh, current uh, uh, report. And, 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 and therefore, to be fair, uh, uh, from the questions as asked by Honorable uh, Shangwa, with the opportunity that he has already had sight of some of the briefings that have been given by uh, various uh, 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 audit <laughs> uh, teams. Um, the, the, the depth in terms of uh, asking those questions uh, is within such. But I, I'll throw it to you, AG, in terms of the um, the, a choice of questions to deal with uh, uh, out, of, out of those. Uh, very Im importantly, uh, uh, maybe to uh, look into uh, some of the areas as asked, PFMA, ESCOM, um, and then other matters, um, other matters which uh, might uh, generally belong to that kind of a a meeting which would uh, require a second bite uh, by various committees. AG. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair and Honorable Chair Thangwa. Um, so the PFMA discussion, I think, is one that we need to have in a very organized and frank way so that we can find each other about um, how much agility we can we need to give and how much accountability we still need for what are public entities. Um, so whether it's about PFMA itself or about the regulations that underpin it, um, it's, it's a different discussion. Um, I would I would ask that we 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 have that very frank and and focused discussion and not uh, not in, in in too general a set of terms. Um, ESCOM takeover, we, 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 we signed off Transnet for the very first time this year. Um, and so the bandwidth from an executive point of view just was not going to be there for us to absorb an audit of the scale, complexity and significance that, that um, ESCOM is. Um, so, so that's one of the reasons why we responded by saying we can't take it on, we're busy dealing with the 
uh, MI process and we've got Transnet and our experience with these things is that um, you've got to, to be measured in, and, and, and um, steady in how you take on these orders. So as a consequence, the ESCOM order has now been allocated to one of the private sector firms that's been appointed to be the external auditor for ESCOM. The office of the AG has got a few members of staff working with that team to complement what they are doing so that at the end of the day, ESCOM gets a, a better um, audit um, with, with the input of both the private sector firm that's leading and the allocation of some of the staff from the, audit of, from the National Audit Office. On compensation fund, um, our team that's on this um, would, would indicate to you um, that their own assessment of the audit action, uh, audit action plan um, and also their own plans around how they can up the level of um, support in terms of focusing on the right things, whether for oversight or for the executive authority or even, or, or even for, for the management there. Um, so I think that one needs um, that team to, to talk to you about even their plans, uh, which they tell me might even include some real-time audits so that they can give you real-time insight on how that plan is being implemented. The parliamentary leg legislature oversight, um, you know, as we keep saying, the, the moment now where we really have to get quite uh, focused on driving accountability improvements. The moment requires all of us, as you say, put out, to put our shoulders to the wheel. Um, and from a parliamentary point of view, we've put some, some recommendations in the presentation and in the report. Um, and and um, we, would, we would love to hear from yourselves, the honorable members, on what you make of those recommendations and which ones you are wanting to implement and how we might support you in implementing those, those, those um, uh, recommendations um, so that you can improve your level of effectiveness in overseeing how government runs and how the accountability mechanisms work. Um, through the MI process, through the service delivery information we've given you, um, I think you have quite a lot of insight that will allow you to, to focus your efforts over the forthcoming months. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, AG, and uh, thank you very much, uh, honorable uh, members. Uh, you would uh, find out that uh, in terms of the report as tabled, there are uh, quite a pertinent matters which have been raised by the Auditor General, and of course, uh, by you, honorable members, uh, through your own questions. Uh, the agency of building uh, some form of a, a stable environment uh, in as far as the achievement uh, of a financial stability and, and uh, management thereof, uh, both uh, within departments and SOEs. Secondly, the worrisome uh, side of how the state-owned entities perform uh, in terms of their own uh, financial ability and, and therefore the necessity uh, for intervention by various uh, departments, mainly uh, at the treasury uh, level. Thirdly, uh, the agency uh, of uh, ensuring that the standard of accountability uh, is improved uh, on the basis of the MI uh, uh, instance where we're in uh, various accounting officers or uh, looking into uh, the accounting authorities, how they speedily uh, resolve certain matters that relate to um, such less accountability as, as envisaged in such a departments or entities. And then uh, fourthly uh, is the area that uh, requires attention uh, on the actual standard uh, in terms of presenting those uh, financial, which is a proof uh, of uh, capability um, at a, a government in general and to sustain a, a better um, a percentage uh, outlook uh, in as far uh, as uh, such uh, financial information uh, to be presented to the Auditor General in terms of time, in terms of quality, and uh, 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 fourthly, in terms of uh, uh, the actual facilitation uh, of finalization of such uh, audits. So that uh, the worrisome uh, instance uh, of a hold of a finalization of such an uh, audit process, which is as a result of uh, those uh, failures. I think 
uh, who have made uh, such uh, examples. And, and lastly, uh, the, the question of instilling uh, a fair responsibility um, at the departmental uh, level, SOE levels, as auditees, uh, which uh, should uh, be predictable uh, in terms of the long-term sustainability and the stability, which is envisaged uh, at that level, because the accountability for such huge press is very critical. So, so, so uh, we thank you, Auditor General, uh, for uh, uh, tabling for us uh, these uh, outcomes. And of course, uh, the two committees uh, would uh, have time uh, to look into independent areas, which would require uh, your teams uh, to come back after we have uh, had time to read uh, your report uh, and be able to uh, call in the way forward on various areas, which are areas of uh, uh, interest. From our side, uh, colleagues, I think I represent you very well to say um, through our questions, to listening to the AG, and as well, we'll have our own opportune moment uh, to look into these uh, financials. We may thank the AG uh, and uh, wish uh, well in the presentation uh, to the public uh, in terms of the press briefing. Uh, I take it this afternoon also uh, uh, on, on these uh, uh, outcomes. Um, so thank you very much. Um, oh, okay, indeed, it's, it's uh, this uh, afternoon at two o'clock uh, when we should be tabling uh, these for the public uh, to uh, look into what kind of outcomes that we enjoy. Um, all the luck, um, uh, all the strength, uh, we uh, stand to wish uh, you good time for holidays if you are going to have those holidays, but uh, to uh, come up with an approach which is going to assist us to ensure that those who are supposed to account, account appropriately. Honorable Shangwa and your team, thank you very much for attending the meeting and your contributions uh, thereof. We work together, I'm part of that uh, committee as well, so I'm part of your, of your team in this instance but uh, to score up as well. Thank you very much, uh, the honorable members. The meeting uh, One thing uh, was is uh, in our thing. Before you Thank you very much. Before you adjourn, just one announcement okay. for the Scoper team. Um, team okay. Scoper, uh, we are meeting this evening at half past six with the minister and the presidency on SIU related matters. So that meeting is proceeding okay. as discussed yesterday, half past six this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the meeting adjourns.